I'm sure most of you know this amazing book, especially if you are teaching secondary. And we are very privileged today to have Dave Spencer, the author of Gateway, and uh, here to talk to you today. So Dave, if you are online, can I invite you to put your microphone and webcam on? Hello. Hi, Dave. Great to see you. Good. So you can see me and hear me, yeah? Yep, loud and clear. It also looks very sunny where you are in the world. Yes, it is. Good. So, Shall I begin? Well, I'll just, I mean, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure you all know um, uh, Dave, uh, but um, Dave is. Um, a very brave man as he trained to be a secondary teacher after studying languages at um, Oxford University. And he moved to Spain where he has been living and teaching ever since and um, continues, I believe, Dave, to teach um, secondary school te uh, students uh, there in Madrid and has been a Macmillan author for a long time. And as I said, um, the latest um, series is the second edition of, of Gateway. And Dave is here today to talk to us about the importance of recycling in vocabulary teaching. So that's enough from me. Dave, over to you. Great. Um, first of all, um, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining me today in this uh, webinar about vocabulary teaching. I think uh, vocabulary teaching is a popular topic. There's a lot to say. I'm going to be speaking for approximately um, 45, 50 minutes, and we will have maybe five minutes for any questions you have. And I will um, explain where you can contact me if you need any more information. Um, right, it is very sunny here in Spain. Um, I hope it's sunny where you are. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, I should have been in class, but I'm with you today, okay? But because I usually teach, I thought I would begin with a game, okay? Now, you can see that I have a lovely Macmillan dictionary here, and I'm going to play a game. I am going to choose a page, and I am going to read out the first word that I find on the page. I am going to give you the first two letters of the word, and then the information that uh, appears in the dictionary about that word. And I want you to tell me what is my word. So can you type the answer in the chat box when you think you know the word? Okay. My first word, it begins with the letters E L E L. It's a noun. It is countable and it's quite frequent. And it says the part in the middle of your arm where it bends. Can you tell? Yes. Who is the first? Oh, wow, that's fast. That's very fast. That's very good. OK, I'm going to continue on the same page with the next word. And I want you to tell me what is my word. E-L, it's a noun. It is countable. And it means someone in your family or community who is older than you. Oh, wow. I didn't finish my definition and you already have the word. OK. One more word, one more word. E-L, it is a verb. It is transitive and it's a frequent word, E-L. And it means to choose someone to represent you or hold an official position. Wow, okay, you're very good, you're very good. This is a lovely game to play in your classes with any old dictionaries that you have. And it's a great way of recycling vocabulary. It's also a great way of getting students to think about dictionaries. And obviously, many people now use online dictionaries, but the uh, information is the same. Now, if you play this game, the next thing that I do is I ask my students a question that seems obvious, but is maybe not so obvious. My question is, what information comes in a dictionary? Now, can you type in any information that comes in a dictionary? What does the dictionary tell us? It gives us examples. It gives us definitions. It also gives us pronunciation, as somebody is saying. 
It also says the type of word, as somebody is saying. It gives us synonyms, which is what somebody has mentioned. It could give us etymology, and it could give us inter idiomatic expressions. Now, the reason that I ask this question is because I think many people simply think that the dictionary gives us the meaning of the word, and that is all. But of course, the dictionary gives us lots and lots of information, all of the things that you are mentioning. And I think the question is that we as teachers know this, but often our teenage students don't know this. So I think it's a good question to ask our students. Many of the things that you've said are on my next slide. Have a look. Meanings of words, examples, types of word, different forms of the same word, word formation. We will talk today about word formation. Spelling. Now, I, I'm not sure if somebody put spelling in the chat box. The way that I most use a dictionary is to check spelling. I think that native speakers, we often use the dictionary to check how we spell a word because spelling in English can be complicated even for somebody like me. Uh, pronunciation, so it tells you the phonemes. It also helps you with the word stress. Now, that's a good question. How do you know the word stress in the dictionary? How do you find it? How is it, um, how is it shown in a dictionary, word stress? Julian has pointed out that it could be in bold. And Julian has put a question mark because it's, it depends on your dictionary. And not every dictionary does it the same way. And I think that our students don't know this information. I think that our students don't know all of these things that actually appear in the dictionary. So I think that this is a great way by playing the game and then asking this question, it's a great way to make them realize how much information the dictionary gives us. Okay, so stress, it could be a stress mark, it could be underlining, or it could be bold. I think those are the three most typical ways to show word stress. The question is, do students know this and can we help them so that they realize? We also have things like collocations and we also have things if the word is formal, informal, maybe it's actually taboo, maybe it's a word that students should not use and they need to know this, okay? Also, the question of how frequent the word is. I told you that elbow is a frequent word. And the reason that I know this is because if you look here where the in the black section, the Macmillan Dictionary has three red stars for very common words, two red stars for common words, and one for fairly common words. And in our word listing gateway, we have this same system. And my point again is simply that students probably do not realize this. They will see the first definition of the word and they won't look at anything else. And we think it's obvious that three red stars mean it's very common, but I think that maybe for our students, it's not so obvious. Now, I want to um, have a think about some very basic questions about vocabulary. And I suppose the most basic question about vocabulary is why is it important to teach it? And I think it's so obvious that sometimes maybe we could even forget. Why do we teach vocabulary? Well, this is a great quotation from David Wilkins. We can communicate little without grammar. We can communicate nothing without vocabulary. And I think that this is a very, very strong um, expression here to make us realize that grammar is important. When you think of a baby, a baby does not begin to speak with correct grammatical sentences. A baby begins to name things. They will say ball, they will say milk, they will name something and they will communicate very successfully by doing that. Obviously, with our learners, we need to teach them grammar so that they can become accurate and also create more complex sentences. But I think the first step of lang language learning is um, vocabulary. There's a very interesting expression about Pocoyo, and I don't I know Pocoyo, but he's he's after my time, so I don't know how much grammar he uses. Um, there's another statement here, which somebody I saw wrote, I think Julian wrote this. Uh, yes, we don't take grammar books when traveling. That's my next statement. When students travel, they don't carry grammar books, they carry dictionaries. This is Stephen Krashen. Obviously, nowadays, students probably don't carry dictionaries. They carry a smartphone. But I think that when they look at their smartphone, they will look for words rather than grammar. I think most of our students will look to find out what this word means. 
they will not look about how to make the third conditional in Turkish, for example. So I think those two statements make it very, very clear why exactly um, vocabulary is so crucial to, um, to our uh, teaching. Now, um, this is a question that seems maybe obvious. What vocabulary do we teach to our students? Now, if I said, what grammar do we teach to our students? We would all say the same, the past tense, the present tense, conditionals, passive. And it would be the same grammar, probably, whatever the age of our students. One interesting thing, I think, with vocabulary is the vocabulary we teach depends on, for example, the age and the interests and the needs of our students. So, for example, primary students might have very different vocabulary needs to advanced students or to pre-intermediate adult students. Maybe with primary, we teach some animals that usually we don't teach to higher levels. But that's because it's necessary for them to talk about their stories, to talk about their songs. What vocabulary do we teach to teenagers? Well, things that they need for their life now, the present. So family, home, appearance, personality, sports, school, those things are all relevant to teenagers today. I think with teenagers, we also want to teach words that are useful for their immediate future. So university, work, they are not working at the moment, but they will work maybe soon in the future. Relationships, shopping, traveling, tourism. So these things are maybe not 100% relevant for them today, but when they leave school, they will be relevant. Um, and then, of course, one thing which I think is very important, and if you know um, Gateway, you will know that this is an important element of Gateway, is that we also teach systems of vocabulary, not just groups of vocabulary like clothes or transport or similar things. We also teach things like suffixes and prefixes. And the reason that we do this is that with these things, we can boost the student's vocabulary very quickly. If we teach the prefix re, we can help the students to create lots of new words. And by the way, can you type in, what does the prefix re, R-E, what does that mean? Again, thank you, Vasily, I think it was. Um, it means again. And so if we teach the prefix re, we can create the words redo, remake, resit, recook, rewrite, re. I mean, there are so many words. Recap, revisit. There are just millions of words. So by teaching these systems of vocabulary, we can increase our students' vocabulary really, really quickly. Now, we also have things like compounds, compound adjectives. We also have, of course, phrasal verbs, which, of course, uh, teachers often love and students often hate. We can also teach things like dependent prepositions, collocation. So not just teaching transport, not just teaching jobs, but also teaching these systems of vocabulary, which in Gateway we teach systematically in every unit. Now, um, there we have in Gateway an example of an exercise where we give the basic word like exist and the students have to create um, then, for example, the noun, the verb, the adverb, or maybe the opposite. And of course, this type of word formation exercise is useful also because it often appears in many exams, particularly many Cambridge exams. Right. Now, um, I think this is interesting then. One, I hope I'm convincing you, of course, of the importance of all of this um, vocabulary teaching. And um, let's go on to the next question which is very important um, in our day-to-day -day teaching, active and passive vocabulary. Um, this, maybe some of you know this distinction, maybe some of you don't know. Let me explain it very, very quickly. Usually we teach, for example, here, countries, nationalities, languages. These words are words that we are teaching so that the students can actually use them. They will need to remember them. They will need to use them again in exercises. Then you need to be able to pronounce the word. You need to know how we use the word in context, 
we need examples. All of the things that we said about the dictionary, all of those different elements, you should know so that you can then use the vocabulary actively. So in Gateway, the first page is active vocabulary. Then when we do a reading text, for example, we often have this exercise, what do the underlined words in the text mean? This we would call passive vocabulary, where the students simply have to understand the word in context so that they understand the text. Now, if the student then remembers the word and can use it actively, that's great, but that's not necessarily our main objective. We are simply asking the students to be able to recognize the word in context so that they can understand more. Obviously, if you see this passive word many times, in the end, it will probably become active. Um, but it's a difference in objective. When we want our students to remember a word, that would be active vocabulary. When we simply want them to understand, and particularly understand in context, then that is passive vocabulary. And that's important because it will change how much emphasis you pay to teaching the word. If it's active, you will spend more time teaching it, more time practicing it. Now, talking about vocabulary, um, I think there are two pieces of news. One is the good news, and then unfortunately, we have the bad news. The good news is that I think it's quite easy to teach words. I think it's quite easy. I could teach you maybe now 20 Spanish words. Um, I think it's quite easy. You can show pictures, you can explain the word, you can give definitions. So that's easy. The bad news about teaching vocabulary is that it's easy to teach, but it's not easy for students to learn. Okay, I think there is a difference. One thing is teaching. Sometimes you see a teacher teaching 20 words, but two minutes afterwards, you realize the students cannot use or remember the words. Now, I have drawn a technical diagram to explain this problem, okay? It's a technical diagram showing the entry and exit of lexical items. Would you like to see my technical diagram? It took me a long time to draw this diagram. Would you like to see it? Of course you would. That's good. That's why you're here, okay? Let me show your, my technical diagram. Here is the first picture. In my technical uh, picture, you can see that the words are going in one ear, okay? And I think the problem with vocabulary teaching is this, that of course, words go in one ear and then they go out of the other ear. And as Oksana has said, remembering words is the challenge. And that's why I have uh, decided to call this talk uh, vocabulary recycling. It's important because without the recycling of vocabulary, then our students will not remember any words. And there is no point teaching vocabulary if we have my technical diagram, if this is what happens. I'm glad that you like my technical diagram. It took a long time to prepare, so I'm glad that you like it. So the question is then, how do students remember words? And this is an experiment that unfortunately, because of time and the difficulty of doing this online, I am not going to do, I am going to simply explain. In this experiment, and you can do this with your students or with groups of teachers, um, it works exactly the same. What happens is you read out a list of words. And while you read out the list of words, the students or the teachers cannot write anything down. When you finish reading, the students write down any words that they remember. Okay, I'll explain that again. You read out the list of words, but when you read out the list, the students cannot write anything down. When you finish, the students can write down anything they remember. The interesting thing with this experiment is not necessarily how many words you remember, it is which words you remember. I'm going to show you my list. And by the way, there will be a handout that you will be able to access after this session, which um, has this experiment and lots of other activities too. Okay, now uh, somebody's asked, there are I think 20 words here. You read out this list of words, 
and then you get the students to write down what they remember. You'll see that this was adapted from a book called The Brain Book, which is all about memory. OK, now um, I've done this experiment probably literally hundreds of times and the results are nearly always the same. OK, now people often write down the word suitcase. Have you got any idea why they might write down the word suitcase? Any any theory? Because it's not such an amazing word. Why do you think they write it down? Any any theories? Well, in fact, the reason that um, they write it down is because if you look at my list, it was the last word in my list. Can you see that? So when you read out the list, it's pretty typical that people remember it because it was the very last word. OK, now people also often write down the word phone. And that's because. It was the first word in my list. Now, this is a in, an interesting thing about memory is that first things and last things are prominent and first things and last things are easier to remember. So maybe when you read a text, the first thing and the last things are probably the things that you will remember best. And it's even possibly true in a lesson that the first and the last activities are the ones that students remember the most. Now. People often write down Lady Gaga. Now, why do you think they write down Lady Gaga? Highly recognizable, famous. Yeah, and I think Sandra has made a good point. She's the only person. She's the only person and it takes you a bit by surprise when you hear this list of normal nouns and you suddenly hear about a famous person, then of course that sticks in your memory. And I think that's very important for vocabulary teaching. When we do an activity that is a little bit different, a little bit unusual, a little bit out of the ordinary, it is much more memorable for students. And I think that's a good reason for doing things like games or game like activities with vocabulary, because it's easier for students to remember. Uh, Julian said the first word I saw, and it is interesting how it stands out from the rest in the list. Right. Well, uh, Samina, I'm going to come to that. You are a genius. I'm going to come to your point in a second. OK, um, now people often write down these types of fruits next to each other in their list. Now, the fascinating thing is that when you read out the list to begin with, if you look closely, the different types of fruit are never together. So there is always a separation between the types of fruit. But when when teachers or students write down their list, they nearly always write the list of fruits as one list together, one after the other because they're in the same group, because they're in the same category. And this is really interesting because this is um, interesting because subconsciously, probably subconsciously, your brain is telling you apple. And when you remember apple, you immediately remember another type of fruit, lemon or orange. And it is interesting. And sometimes people even invent fruit that I never said in the list. Maybe they say strawberry because they start thinking about fruit and they get confused which type of fruit. Um, Ulrika makes a very good point, which some people do this, um, of making things into a story where you get a connection between all of these different things. And that definitely works for some people. Now, one fascinating thing is that nearly everybody, when you do this experiment, try this with your students, nearly everybody writes down pair as P-E-A-R. They could write P-A-I-R, but because we are thinking in terms of fruit, we write the first one, not the second one. And as Samir is saying, we actually, that's a reason for teaching things in categories because it helps students to remember much more. So I think that's fascinating that people remember or write down P-E-A-R and it's because your brain is telling you fruit, 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 and then you automatically think of other types of fruit. 
And um, this is interesting. Have you got any theory why people write down the word fog? Fog is a little bit of a boring word. It's a little bit of a sad word. Why do you think people write down fog? Have you got any theories? Ah, somebody got that. I can't read who it is, but somebody said straight away, that was very clever. Somebody said that it was twice in my list. Have a look. Have a look. You can see that fog appears uh, in, after mouse and then it appears before melon. Now, um, for me, this is fascinating. And this, for me, is the key to everything. Repetition. Uh, we will never teach words quickly if we only teach them once. And um, I think this is really fascinating. If I was learning Turkish, I wouldn't be able to read voc uh, under, sorry, I wouldn't be able to remember vocabulary if I heard it once and then never heard it again. The key to vocabulary teaching is frequency, okay, repetition. And if you teach a word on Monday and the students never see it again, I think it's almost impossible that your students will remember it. Repetition, okay? It's the fact that we remember things when they're repeated. Hamid is mentioning, does it have to be meaningful? And yes, I would think that it should be meaningful. Let's see some examples in a minute. Now, another interesting thing, somebody mentioned creating a story. What I think is fascinating is people often make other connections. In the same list, we had tennis. And if you remember tennis, you might think of ball. If you think of cat, you might think of mouse. If you think of mouse, you might think of dog. Our brain is looking for connections. And I think this is fascinating. Melon and lemon, they sort of say, sound similar. Apple, pineapple, they rhyme. Fog and dog. And I think that um, particularly primary students, uh, teachers often use songs, poems, rhymes because they are very memorable. And um, our brain subconsciously looks for these connections, looks for these rhymes, uh, looks for these connections between words. So um, we need to build on all of those connections to get students putting the connections together. And somebody mentioned this before, maybe I think it was maybe Samira mentioned, um, if you like those things, there is more chance that you will write them down. If you like jazz, then probably you will remember, hey, he said jazz in the list, I remember. If you love horses and you love horse riding, maybe you'll think because I love horses that you said the word horse. And I think that personal association, personal connection is really important in um, this context. So we said before, if the students will see a connection with jazz, yeah, actually Victoria's made a good point. It could be hate as well as love, okay? And even with Lady Gaga, that could be hate as well as love. It creates a strong personal reaction, okay? Now, there's one funny thing that there is a word which often people forget to write down. Uh, I'm going to show you the word, but this typically, when I do this experiment, lots and lots of people forget to write this word, okay? And the word is school. And uh, I think there are different theories. Maybe subconsciously you are trying to forget school, or maybe it's because school is the opposite of Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga is unusual, and as Ulrika says, maybe school is too obvious. You forget about it because it's such a normal part of your life. But it is fascinating that many students forget actually to write down that word. And as I say, it's the opposite of Lady Gaga. Maybe we're trying to forget school and think about the holidays, okay? So it's a fascinating experiment. Do try to do this experiment with your students, or if you are involved in teacher training, try this with a group of your colleagues, of other teachers, and I think you will find that the results are very similar to my own results that I've told you about here. Now, I think that the reason for doing this experiment is that it shows us that when we do recycling activities, they will probably be more effective if they are uh, sorry, out of the ordinary, unusual, different. I think they will be more memorable if they include personalization or personal associations. 
I think they will work better if they group words according to meaning. So we saw the example of fruit. One thing that I think is very powerful, we talked about phrasal verbs. If you use gateway, you will know that the way that we teach phrasal verbs is, is linking them according to meaning. So we do things like phrasal verbs connected with work, because if I remember one phrasal verb connected with work, it will help me to remember others. Um, and obviously, uh, we learn those words within a context, a meaningful context. Uh, that's why in Gateway, then, we do this, we take this approach. We don't link phrasal verbs according to their um, particle, their preposition. We uh, link them according to meaning. Next, um, I think that vocabulary activities work better if they invo involve students and if they have lots of participation. Uh, I think also we saw that the beginning and the end of uh, a list is memorable. And I think that the start and end of the lesson is a perfect time to do a vocabulary game, a vocabulary activity. Um, and I nearly always begin my lesson or finish my lesson with some sort of vocabulary revision. And we talked about the word fog then I think fog um, was the good example of they need to be frequent. The more frequent our activities, the more frequently we revise, the better. Right, now, um, of course, in Gateway, at the end of each unit, that is precisely the moment when we revise all the vocabulary that we've learned. So we've taught it in the unit, but then we need to recycle it again. And we need to make the list of vocabulary clear to our students so they know what to revise. And also one thing that is useful is um, a cumulative revision. So in Gateway, in the workbook, we revise grammar and vocabulary mixed together. Sometimes we teach a group of words and we only practice within that group. I think it's a good idea to practice all of the words that we have taught from September to, for example, April, May right now, mix those words together. Right, now I'm going to miss that part out because what I want to do now in the next 10-15 minutes is give you some activities that you can use with your students this afternoon, tomorrow, this morning, whatever time it is for you. Um, the first word, the, sorry, the first game is hangman. And of course, usually with hangman, we play with one word. And this is an invention, lexical set hangman. One thing that I would like to point out, I always think it's important to point out, I am not saying that I invented any of these activities, okay? I'm a very old teacher now, and I've picked many games up from colleagues, from books, from seminars, from conferences. So these are not my activities. They are activities that I'm passing on to you, sharing, but I'm not saying that I invented any of them, okay? I just like to point that out. Now, Lexical set hangman, we have got, for example, in this game, we've got six different words and they all have a connection, okay? Now, the way that we would play is, of course, by guessing letters. Um, now, what happens is, and, and Julian already wants to play, and I wish I could play this properly. This is already prepared on the um, uh, preparation on the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So we can't play, unfortunately, but I've got an example of a game, okay? Now, what happens is if you guess one letter correctly, you get one point. If you guess a word correctly, so at any moment you can guess a word, you get five points for the word. And if you guess um, the connection between the words, you get 10 points. Of course, meanwhile, um, if you make a wrong guess, it's minus one for a letter, minus five for a wrong word, and minus 10 for a wrong connection, okay? Now, I hope that this little example of the game will help you to see what how we play it. You imagine that it's your turn to play, team A, what uh, letter would you like? What letter would you choose? E, definitely a vowel seems like a good idea, right? Okay, team A chooses the letter A. Let's have a look if we've got the letter A. Okay, that's good. Now you notice, please notice that the letter A appears three times, but it's still one point because it's one point for the letter, not for the number of times that the letter appears. Okay, that's important. Okay, it appears three times, but it's one point. Now, if you could choose the next letter, what letter would you choose if you were in team B? So I've got two teams. 
R E L. Okay, well, team B chooses the letter B. Okay, and look, here we are. And again, it appears this time four times, and you get one point. Okay, does anybody does anybody think they know a, a word? Oh, well, let's continue. Team A says the letter O. The letter O, yes. Okay, and again, it's one point. Now, some people are making correct guesses and some people are making wrong guesses. And this is why it's interesting in class because some people will be getting five points or minus five, okay? Some people are saying boat, some people are saying bus. Team B says the letter T, they get six points, okay? They get six points because it's the correct letter and they have a word, boat. And obviously, this is a pretty easy category for you, okay? So you're already guessing, somebody's saying motorbike, let's have a look. We continue, we think the first word is bus, the last word is motorboat. Correct, 10 points. And as you've already guessed, types of transport. I think you can understand the game, yes? I think it's pretty clear. The great thing about this game is that we could use it with very simple vocabulary, or we could use it with very complicated, advanced C1, C2 vocabulary. So these activities are very uh, flexible. You could use them with any type of group of words. What might happen is the students think of types of transport that are not on the blackboard. And that's fine. That's great. That's even better because they're remembering all of the words connected in a lexical set. OK, so very simple game. I hope you try that out today or tomorrow and see if it works for you. It's also on the handout, OK, so you can read it again. Now, um, one of my favorite activities is the A to Z of. Uh, and this is so simple. This is the best way I find to recycle the uh, words. Yeah, one thing, somebody, um, Motombi, has just said you must teach the student first. Yes, do remember that these are all recycling activities, revision activities, not presentation activities. That's a good point. Uh, okay, the A to Z of jobs. So, um, yeah, as I said, Motomi, so it is, yeah, it's thinking of revision, not presentation. So we've got the A to Z of jobs. A is for architect. B is for baker, builder. Okay, I've got builder. C is for... Now, a cat is not a job. I'm sorry, but I've never seen a cat as a job, okay? Cook, carpenter, chef, excellent, okay? D, dentist, E, electrician. This is a great activity because it forces students to revise a group of words which um, are pretty, they, maybe they've seen these words again and again, but by forcing them to think of a different letter for each, sorry, a different word for each letter of the alphabet, we're forcing them to think of maybe less common words. Now, I think um, you probably enjoy doing this with you or with your students. Now, Shannon has asked the question that I want to share with you now. What do you do when you get to X or Q? Right, two things. One is that you make it clear to students that if they need to miss out a letter, do not worry. So I think the first thing to say is, don't worry. If you can't think of a letter, sorry, if you can't think of a word, leave that letter and come back to it later. The other thing, as some people are doing now, is I think that this game is great for creative cheating, okay? So I think sometimes we can let the students use their imagination. For example, for K, any idea for K? Yeah, now you see Julian's got exactly the right idea. Yogurt taster for kite flyer, exactly. So in other words, kleptomaniac, I like that one, I like that one. Karate teacher is the one that I usually use, or king, yeah? Q, of course, we've also got queen, okay? I live in Spain where we have two kings, so there's lots of uh, kings around. And X, of course, is a little bit difficult. We always have xylophonist, I think, and also my favorite is X-ray technician. OK, so uh, it was a very good point. If there's a difficult letter, tell the students not to worry and also tell them that a little bit of creative cheating is fine. Karaoke teacher, Kar professional karaoke teacher. That's a great job. I want to do that job. OK, you get the idea. And again, this is the A to Z of jobs. We can use this for animals. We can use this for adjectives of personality. We can even use it for irregular past forms or ir irregular past participles. Very flexible, works at any level. 
Yes, of course, the students have to have some level of English before they can do it. This is not for beginners, but I think that you can find um, lots of different uh, moments when you can use an activity to recycle vocabulary sets that the students have already seen before. Right, this is possibly my favorite activity, vocabulary tennis, okay? Again, this is for recycling, not for presentation. You have t, uh, two teams. If you have a big class, for example, 25 students, you can adapt this activity so that you have, for example, five groups and you play the same game, but instead of going backwards and forwards, you go round the class. So if you have a large class, of course, think of different ways that you can adapt the same idea. Um, what happens is the teacher gives a, a, a prefix, for example, you can see here, okay? And we have two teams. The prefix miss, what does miss mean? Miss as a prefix. Wrong, yes. So rather than just um, a negative, it means that it's being done wrong incorrectly. Okay, now what happens is you have two teams. Each team has a spokesperson. And the teams have to take it in turn, giving you a word, a correct word, that begins with this prefix. If they cannot think of a word, they lose the point. If they give an incorrect word, they lose the point. And if they repeat a word, they also miss the point. Because they are listening so that they don't repeat the words, it's good because it's a, a game that is pretty quiet. Okay, let's see what happens in my practice presentation. Okay, we've got team A says misunderstand, team B says mishear, team A says misconception, team B says mispronounce, and team A says Miss America. Is Miss America correct? No, I think we all agree. Obviously, it doesn't exist. Okay, so that means that team B is winning love 15. OK, now we can do this with prefixes and, of course, we can do this with suffixes. The suffix ness, what type of word do you create with a suffix ness? Nouns, OK. Team A, kindness. Team B, sadness. Team A, darkness. Team B, happiness. Team A, Loch Ness. Is team A correct? Team A is not, not correct. That is not a correct suffix. And so team B is winning love 30. OK, now this is great for prefixes and suffixes. We can also use it for any group of words at any levels. OK, so rooms in a house, dining room, bedroom, living room, bathroom, chicken. Does, does this happen with your students? In Spain, students get very confused between kitchen and chicken, okay? And so, uh, obviously, team A is having a very bad day today, okay? And team B is losing. You can see the idea of the game, okay? Very simple, just a great way for recycling all the vocabulary sets that you have um, practiced so far in the year. Choose lots of groups. You can make some groups easy, some groups difficult. And it's just a very simple game to play. OK, and again, you don't need any material. OK, so you just need the blackboard, prepare the vocabulary sets before, and that's easy to do. OK, um, just I'm going to explain two or three more games to you if I can, and then we will stop and see if you have any final questions. Um, now, this is noughts and crosses or tic-tac-toe. You put these nine prefixes on the blackboard. You can have, for example, again, two teams or more teams, and they choose a prefix, and they have to think of, for example, three words that contain this prefix, and if they are correct, the square is theirs, okay? If they are wrong, the square remains blank. And of course, the idea is to get three squares in a row. Yeah, um, I hope that's clear. It's pretty easy. You can do the same game, of course, for uh, suffixes in exactly the same way. Take it in turns. The, the teams have to choose a prefix and then they write down, for example, three words to do that. Again, minimal preparation, minimal materials, 
works very, very well for B1 plus and above. And um, we started with a dictionary game, and this is another dictionary game. Um, what you do is you tell your students to think of words which are on this page of the dictionary. The first word is phone, and the last word is physics. And what you do is you get the students to brainstorm any words that appear on that page of the dictionary. What is important is to uh, point out how compound words um, work in English and how um, word formation works in English. Because if you think of uh, compound nouns, can you think of a compound noun from the word phone? Is there a word that you could make with phone? Phone book, exactly. Pay phone, phone box, phone call. So if you explain this to your students from the beginning, then it's a great way to practice all of that um, word formation and compounds. Uh, and we're generating, again, lots and lots of different words. Um, from physics, there are lots of words that we could also use. Can you think of any word that's connected with physics that would appear on this page? Physical, exactly, good. So we've got the adjective. We could also have the person, physicist. We could also have a physician, exactly, Lucia, yeah, or Lucia, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, so that's a very simple game again. Uh, no materials needed, five, ten minutes for students to brainstorm those words. And then what they can do is get a dictionary and check their answers and get them to choose their favorite word on the page. Here are lots of words that do appear. You'll notice that a lot of these words appear in teaching as well, don't they? Have you noticed phrasal verb? Have you noticed, uh, that's right, so sorry, Shannon, yes, I, maybe I didn't explain. At the beginning, the students are brainstorming without a dictionary, and when they've brainstormed for five, 10 minutes, they can check with the dictionary. OK, obviously, these are not all of the words that would appear in the dictionary on this page, but these are a selection. Um, and I've chosen two words in particular to show how fascinating vocabulary is. Fulkari is a word that um, it's actually, uh, I could read the dictionary for you. You can go and check online, OK? You can uh, find that word out. My point was that even as native speakers, you will never know all of the words that appear in a language or in a dictionary. OK, also, I like that expression to go foot, which is when something um, suddenly stops working and makes a little explosive noise. Uh, Motombi is asking, will this webinar be uploaded on YouTube? And yes, it will definitely be uploaded and you can watch this again. Yeah, actually, Shannon makes a good point that this is a good lesson for native speakers. I think that all, as all teachers and native speakers, we love words and enjoy this type of activity. Um, I'm not going to explain that activity. I'm going to finish with one last activity. Read my lips, a favorite activity of mine. It's pretty obvious. Watch my face, watch my lips, and I am going to say a type of fruit, okay? And I want you to write in the chat box what type of fruit am I saying, okay? It, it was banana, okay? Next one, okay? Ready? Watch this. Yes, you've got it, orange. Uh, one more. This is going to be a long one, okay? Any idea that one? Yes, watermelon. Right, now, I've chosen fruit because we were talking about fruit earlier. I want you to imagine any group of words that you have just taught your students. Imagine doing this activity. What happens is your students are shouting out the words because they want to show how clever they are. We are recycling vocabulary. We are practicing some pronunciation. We are doing a drill, but the students enjoy doing the drill because they want to do it, because there is a challenge. Um, it has to be a vocabulary group, because if you don't tell them what group the word is in, it's a very difficult activity. If it was literally any word in the English language, the students have no chance. If you tell them the type of words, so imagine that it was adjectives of personality, and then you recycle the words that you taught them yesterday, last week, and you will then get the students to, um, to uh, guess the words. 
Um, Ulrika found it difficult. Maybe it's also because we're doing this by camera, but try doing it with your class. See if it works, okay? I think you'll find that um, it's actually lots of fun. And even sometimes when students are confused, it can also be fun, okay? I think the idea is to make it as fun as possible. Excellent. Um, we have now finished the activity. Um, there will be a handout, as we've mentioned. Do access that. Lots of practical things to try out. I hope that you try some of these games with your classes now. If you don't already know, you can contact me at the Macmillan Gateway Facebook page, where there are lots of other videos there, lots of activities. Do try all of these activities out, because obviously um, the real aim of a session like today is for you to share these activities in the classroom. Uh, maybe some activities you think will work better than others, but you might be surprised that uh, things by trying them out, you'll see. And also adapting activities. I think it's really important. Everybody teaches in a different situation, a different context. Try it out and feel free to adapt it. Maybe create your own version of the game. So Dave, um, listen, on, on behalf of Macmillan Education, I want to say a big thank you um, to you. Another, another brilliant um, webinar, lots of great tips. Um, you should be able to see the link to the um, Macmillan Gateway um, Facebook page. So yeah, if you do try out those activities, if it was your first um, webinar, um, join the Facebook group and, and let us know um, how it goes if you're using those activities in the, in the classroom. And of course, sorry Dave, yep. Yeah, there was just one question that somebody made. I think it was Lucia or Lucia. I'm not sure how to um, to pronounce your name. Sorry, um, but you asked about adults. Definitely try it out. I mean, if you've got a class of very serious business students, it, uh, business uh, men or women, maybe it won't work as well. But actually, I've done nearly all of these things with um, adults too, and they've enjoyed them. So try it out. Depends on the context of your class but I think that um, they will enjoy them too. Hannah, I think, agrees with me. I would have a go. Sorry, I just wanted to answer that question. Sure, no problem. And of course, don't forget the wonderful book, um, Gateways, the second edition. So um, if you haven't had a look, contact your local um, Macmillan office and they uh, will answer your questions and let you have a look. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all you teachers. We know how busy you are, and, and we've seen that some of you are joining us in the middle of the night or before breakfast, so we really appreciate you taking that time. We know how busy you are. And as a reward, you will get one of these beautiful advancing learning certificates. You don't need to do anything. Uh, we will um, send it to you by your email. And I think, Dave, we should say a special thank you to you for your amazing technical drawing. Um, ah, that I like was that. The you that. I've created my own. I'm not sure if anyone can see. <laughs> this is my summary of your of your webinar, but um, not as uh, not as impressive as your uh, technical <laughs> drawing. Uh, has anyone got sorry? I'm a real artist. You, yeah. I think we're on the same level, Dave, as artists. Um, so, does anyone have a, a final question for Dave? We've got um, two minutes uh, left. Matombi, thank you for running through Bangkok traffic just to be here. I'm, I hope that you found it useful. Uh, Right, well, Christina, I mean, uh, yeah, there are a lot of activities. Do have a look at the handout, which remember that the handout, you can access it. We'll, we, we're, I think Sonali um, is putting an, an email address that you can um, click on and apply to. And if not, um, contact me at the Macmillan Gateway Facebook page if you don't get a handout. But on that handout, there are lots of other activities too, okay? So today, I've just shown um, four or five activities. On the handouts, I think there are another five or so. Uh, a question about written recycling or spoken recycling. I think, you know, both are fine. I mean, both are great. Maybe it depends on the group of words, depends on the level, but I think both of them work equally well. The really important thing, I think, is the question that I've said a few times is frequency and recycling. I think sometimes we underestimate the importance of 
giving the words again and again. Um, and nobody can learn vocabulary if you don't um, see words frequently. Which is your favorite activity? That's a good question. I've got so many, but I do like vocabulary tennis. That is one of my favorites. Okay, and I think perhaps that's a good question um, to, to finish on. Mm -hmm.